All right, we can get going now. All right, thanks, uh, Nina, for helping on the technical side, and apologies for uh, the initial hitches. Um, and thanks to Kerry Clark for, for inviting me to participate in the uh, webinar series for the faculty. Um, so I'm, uh, I've headed up the Refugee Health Service in Sydney for the last 16 years or so, and we provide a range of services um, to newly arrived refugees and others of refugee background in uh, Sydney in particular. We also have a role with upskilling health professionals around New South Wales on uh, issues relevant to uh, those of refugee background who are living here. And our other role is around uh, policy advice uh, to the Ministry of Health, to local health districts, also um, providing input to things like screening guidelines and uh, other pieces of expertise that exist um, uh, in New South Wales and around the country. So this topic is not necessarily exam material and as, as I hear you all about to switch off, let me say that there is crossover nevertheless with um, broader cross-cultural issues and it's always a topical area and it'll continue to be topical, it's not going to go away um, Europe at the moment is showing us that um, and it's very relevant general knowledge I think to public health physicians and others who are interested in, in um, world events, in um, geopolitical issues, uh, in humanitarian issues, so hopefully it, um, it gives you some insights into that and hopefully at the end um, technical aspects um, being Forgiving, we'll be able to have some uh, interaction and questions from you as well for those who are online today. Um, the focus, I'm afraid, is um, on Australia. I'm aware there might be some uh, New Zealand uh, trainees online or, or uh, fellows. Um, I'll try to throw in some relevant bits of information around uh, the Kiwi side of things where I can. So. The background um, I will give is just um, some definitions because often people are not sure of the, uh, the types of individuals that we're talking about um, and a little bit about how people come to, to Australia and New Zealand. Um, then just talk about some aspects of um, health needs and health issues amongst those of refugee background from these different perspectives, so around disease prevention, health promotion, cultural competency, and then a bit of a case study about policy that impacts on health. And all of those are part of the competencies that, um, that are required for public health physicians. So to start with some definitions, and most people think that all refugees in Australia come by boat. Well, that's what you would get from the media, but that's not true. But just to clarify that um, when somebody is displaced by civil unrest or pers persecution or war, they're actually initially an internally displaced person, so before they've crossed a border. Once they cross that border, then they are defined rather as an asylum seeker, so that is someone who's crossed that border and in essence is seeking refugee status in whichever country they, they end up in, either the first country of, of exile or, or a subsequent country. So they're people who haven't yet had their claims for refugee status formally assessed. Then the next stage, if you like, of this continuum is, is where somebody has, has, has had that claim assessed and um, has met the definition or the formal definition of a refugee, which is, uh, comes from the 1951 Convention uh, on Refugees. And that's someone who is not um, in their country of nationality. They're fearful of going back because of past or possible persecution. And that persecution might be on the basis of either their race, their religion, the nationality they hold, a particular social group of which they're a member, or their political opinion. So it can be all of those things. And that, obviously that is the formal definition and there, there may be a lot of other bases for persecution, but they may, it may not fit that strict formal definition of uh, refugee. So how do people then come to Australia who, who are of refugee background? Um, this is a simplified version of how people get here. Um, 
and the biggest part of the program is what's called the offshore program. That's the immigration department jargon. And essentially, they are people who are overseas. They have formal refugee status, and they apply to get resettled in another country. Uh, and that may be Australia, or it might be Canada, the US, New Zealand, um, or Sweden, for example. Um, they are refugee applicants. Um, they go through certain health and character checks. And if that is successful, then they become part of our humanitarian uh, enter into program, and that's just part of our migration program. And Australia accepts around uh, 13,700 people per year under that program. Um, there is, however, the onshore program, and that that happens when somebody um, comes to Australia um, either by plane, in fact, or by boat, um, and applies for asylum when they're in Australia, and the same could apply in New Zealand, where they, they might come by plane. Um, and so they're called an asylum seeker because they're outside their country and they're applying for refugee status here in Australia. A small proportion of those will be successful in getting refugee status um, and they then form part of that humanitarian um, migration program and settle permanently in Australia. The others may be deported, um, they may be here for a long time going through a long process of uh, appeal and attempting to get that refugee status. Um, so I mentioned New Zealand, uh, they have a system of around 750 um, what they call quota refugees each year, um, so quite a small number. Um, they also have some asylum seekers, as I said. And just so that you know, globally speaking, um, if we think about the number of people around the planet who are displaced, and it's increasing every day, and we see it on our TV screens every evening, um, there's over 50 million people displaced globally through war, civil unrest, persecution, etc. Um, around a quarter of those have formal refugee status, so something like 12 million. The proportion of that 12 million who get resettled in a country like Australia or New Zealand in any one year is less than 100,000. So it's less than one in 100 of all of those people with formal refugee status. This is not saying anything about those who are asylum seekers or internally displaced. Less than 1% of those with formal refugee status already are resettled in a country like Australia. It's a very small proportion and it's a very difficult road to take, which explains perhaps why people sometimes take different paths. This next slide um, shows the composition of Australia's offshore refugee program, so in 13 14. Um, and there's three things to get from this slide. The first is that there are two columns, one labelled refugee and one labelled SHP, which stands for Special Humanitarian Program. The refugee column, that's people who have no family or other links in Australia. They're fully funded by the Australian government to travel here and, and be settled. Those in the middle column, SHP, are sponsored by family or community groups. Um, and those individuals or groups pay for the airfare for those individuals and then help them to settle after they arrive here. Um, the second thing is that you'll see there was around 11,000 in that financial year um, came through this program um, from various countries. And the other two and a half, 1,000 would have been made up of that onshore program by people who had been asylum seekers and got successful refugee status here. And the third thing to take from this slide is the pie chart, which shows um, at least 50% of the intake of that year was from the Middle East. Um, and that a very small proportion was from Africa. And that demonstrates the uh, dynamic nature of refugee settlement in Australia uh, and indeed in New Zealand. Um, if we looked at that pie graph back in around 2008, um, then something like 70% would have been of African background um, and the years prior to that. So it means that services that deal with um, refugee health and other aspects of refugee settlement have to be very adaptable and have to um, move with the times based on where people are coming from. Just to give you something about the bigger picture, if you like, of refugee health in Australia now, um, uh, I thought I'd point out that there is actually no national refugee health strategy. And um, a sort of offshoot of that is there's no particular person in the Department of Health in Canberra who has responsibility for refugee health. So tomorrow I'm um, flying on, this is September, 30, I'll be flying to Canberra to talk about the incoming Syrian influx um, to Australia over the coming months. And 
Yeah, there's actually nobody, I guess, identified specifically in the Department of Health who, who, who would be at that meeting. And so it's just an interesting policy aspect. At the state and territory level, there are jurisdictions in Australia that have plans. Um, certainly New South Wales and Victoria, the two big states who resettle the largest numbers, um, have refugee health plans. I'm not aware that the smaller states and territories do have them at this stage. And there are varying models of healthcare um, around the country. Um, uh, and essentially that varies from um, sort of nurse-led clinics based in um, different uh, community health centres, for example, uh, a decentralised type of model, or GPs in community health clinics such as in uh, Victoria. There are in other um, smaller states and territories they have more centralised um, migrant health services, if you like, uh, like in Perth and Adelaide. Um, and then there are also specialised clinics, hospital-based clinics like for uh, refugee children, um, for example, usually, um, uh, usually focusing on the paediatric aspect. Um, the the, the uh, model in New Zealand is in fact much more centralised because of their small numbers and they have the Mangaree Reception Centre in Auckland where all newly arrived refugees uh, go for a period of around six weeks and they have a variety of uh, interventions there, a variety of government and other uh, agencies assisting them. They have health screening, um, health education, immunisation is commenced, etc. So it's a, it's a very different model um, and it's really particular to New Zealand because of the the small numbers, um, the geographical size of the country um, and the fact that they, they're able to do that. Uh, the last slide around background for you is just to highlight some of the key features of people of refugee background who, who are resettled in, in developing countries. And these might sound fairly obvious but it's just a bit of uh, so that you're thinking about the kind of likely impacts on health health status and health needs. Unlike other migrants, they are forcibly displaced um, and there's by definition nearly always trauma, psychological trauma associated with that forcible displacement, some of which is horrific. The two words that we often hear and most often hear are loss and grief um, and they are almost universal um, within the, the experience of people of refugee background. Um, they will have always had a disruption to family and uh, normal societal life, disruption to their work, um, to their hopes for future employment, disruption to their education. Um, healthcare access has often been limited, not only in their country of origin perhaps, and possibly because of persecution and being part of a minority, but then when they cross borders, um, again, they can be in very tenuous circumstances and access to healthcare can be difficult. That being said, we should always remember that um, people who reach here either as refugees or indeed as asylum seekers are um, certainly resilient and they're extremely keen to contribute to society here, um, to learn English, to, to get educated and, and to get employed and that's, uh, that's what a large proportion of them manage to do. So that was background, that's who we're talking about and some of the issues. Um, so to, to focus more specifically now on some of the things um, you might be interested in. Um, so the first theme is disease prevention, of, um, or the first overarching subtopic, and I've mentioned the themes there on this slide that this pertains to uh, in the uh, FATM curriculum. So the, the first thing I thought I'd mention is health screening overseas. So what are people screened for before they come to Australia? And some of this is um, similar for New Zealand as well, although most of their screening is now done on shore. So essentially uh, a chest x-ray to exclude active TB uh, is done for anyone of that age, 11 years and over, and an HIV serology test for anyone 15 years and over. So this is common to migrants as well as refugees. Um, Refugees only will have syphilis serology as well if they're 15 years and over. What's important to note is what's not done routinely. So something like hepatitis B serology, um, including for people who might, may come from countries where that condition is very prevalent, there is no routine screening for hepatitis B and, um, and that's something that's important for health service provision uh, once they arrive here. <coughs> 
The other thing that happens is, and this is only for refugees, is around 72 hours before flying out of uh, wherever they're flying from, then those refugees, and this may not apply to the sponsored half that I mentioned towards the beginning, but those refugees who are fully funded by the government will have a pre-departure check done by the International Organisation for Migration or by a panel physician contracted by the Department of Immigration here in Australia. And what they do is essentially to check that the person hasn't developed something like measles in the last few days before they're getting on the plane. If they're from a malarious area, they'll have a RDT rapid diagnostic test for malaria. So that's a finger prick um, antigen test. Uh, if it's positive, they'll be treated and still allowed to get on the plane, assuming they're not too unwell. Um, albendazole is a broad spectrum anti drug and that is given on spec to people um, over the age of two years and who aren't pregnant and that is to reduce the worm burden in their gut. It doesn't kill everything but it does kill off a number of different types of parasites in the gut. And the MMR vaccine single dose is given um, for those between the ages of nine months and 54 years. So that's only for, for refugees, not other migrants. And that was introduced in 2005 in, uh, in Australia, or for those coming to Australia. Once people arrive here, um, as I said, there are different models depending on which state and territory people will go into and indeed where in that state. So there may be different models in rural and regional parts of a state compared with, uh, say, the capital city. Um, certainly important to note that general practitioners um, and other Primary health care providers have an important role and will have the major ongoing role for health care for those of refugee background. There are some guidelines to help GPs and others with that difficult task because they can be complex individuals to see, particularly when they first arrive. So the Australian Asian Society for Infectious Diseases, ACID, created some guidelines in 2009. They were actually done when the African intake was large and they are, they are focusing on infectious diseases as the name suggests and focusing on the African cohort. So they are out of date, they're currently under review and a new guideline with a broader remit um, and, and a different focus, a broader focus uh, will be released before the end of this calendar year. But certainly broadly speaking, um, health assessments that are undertaken um, to reduce disease in this cohort uh, will include an assessment of any current health issues um, and any risk factors that they might have. There may be an element of screening to be done because you recognise that even though there's been screening overseas, there are certain things, and I highlighted one of them, uh, certain things that haven't been done. And, and that screening, obviously, like any other screening, needs to be appropriate. It needs to be relevant to their country of origin, their age, their gender, and any risk factors that are identified. And then um, services seeing newly arrived refugees will, of course, refer those individuals on to appropriate um, health and support services um, uh, in that local region. So the sorts of health issues that are seen in those of refugee background, I'm not going to go into in any detail because you don't need to know them in detail, but just so that you're, you're aware of the sorts of um, issues that uh, practitioners deal with. Um, and some of them will be self-evident based on what I've said already, and you can start to think about the sort of things that people of refugee background are likely to, to be found to have um, um, because of their past experiences, certain things won't be there because they've had uh, already had screening overseas. Um, nevertheless, um, some of the data that we um, we create here in Australia does show that despite that screening overseas, there are some significant morbidities that uh, that do persist. Obviously, psychological distress is extremely common, and there is a range of uh, interventions that might help with that, and I'll mention some of those later. But um, it's almost a given that there'll be a degree of psychological distress in those of refugee background. The first physical thing I always mention, particularly to doctors, is oral health, because doctors aren't very good about thinking about the mouth. And um, I, we always mention this because particularly people from certain regions in the world, their, their oral health is very poor for a number of reasons you can imagine. And um, that's certainly an important uh, health issue to identify and to address after arrival. 
Vitamin D deficiency for a whole range of reasons um, is extremely common and it's not just related to um, dark skin tone, it's also due to religious covering, it might be due to just people being scared and staying indoors a lot of the time um, and, and not getting the appropriate sunshine. So um, we spend a lot of time educating people um, and treating vitamin D deficiency. Um, chronic conditions um, might be either of the well, under immunization I should have mentioned earlier is um, a very common finding as well, both in children and adults and, and needs addressing. Chronic conditions, um, maybe of the infectious variety, and I mentioned um, hepatitis B as one that, that is found um, uh, not uncommonly. But of course, um, non-communicable diseases um, such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease have often been under-managed, and this is something where we'll be expecting to see in the Syrian influx uh, about to arrive here. Uh, where it's known that those sort of conditions are prevalent and the management of those conditions, even if it was being done well in Syria since the war broke out four and a half years ago, will have gone downhill and their access to appropriate medications and uh, monitoring in camps and in cities um, in Turkey, Jordan and Lebanon will have been limited. Child growth and development is always um, something that can be impacted upon by, in fact, the, uh, the refugee trajectory and that is something that practitioners need to, um, to be observant for. Nutritional deficiencies uh, are usually, um, the most common one would be iron deficiency and we see a lot of anemia related to that. We also see anemia from other causes, but certainly iron deficiency, particularly in young women, is extremely common. Sexual assault is known to be common in the refugee setting and um, there can be health issues um, because of that. And there are always sensitive issues to talk about, particularly in the cross-cultural setting. So that's, um, that's something that needs to be addressed, but obviously perhaps not early on in, in the interaction with, with the individuals. Um, reproductive needs can be either contraceptive or, or in fact, People present with infertility at other times and um, sometimes women have undergone female genital mutilation as well depending on where they're from and that's certainly a, a difficult uh, issue to deal with. Um, and then there can be injuries um, direct or indirect from, from war or indeed torture and there are certainly torture survivors uh, in Australia um, who need uh, quite specialised uh, service provision. Just a slide with um, a summary of some of the disease detection rates that have been found in, in, uh, in a number of studies. You'll see that the prevalence rate ranges are extremely varied, so it all depends, of course, on the group, where they were from, um, what age they were, what test was actually used to measure certain uh, uh, conditions. Um, nevertheless, um, a couple of key messages here are, I've already mentioned that anemia is quite common, vitamin D deficiency can be extremely common um, in the refugees we see who are mainly from the Middle East, we find around 70% are vitamin D deficient. Latent tuberculosis infection is there, if you go looking for it, you will find it. Whether you go looking for it is another matter and uh, it's all about whether you can offer preventive therapy or not and whether, it's, um, whether you have the resources to monitor people over six to nine months uh, to do that and it is a controversial issue in Australia at the moment. I've already referred to chronic hep B. Conversely, hepatitis C, when it is looked for, is rarely found uh, or, or around a prevalence possibly similar to Australia. So again, it's a matter of you could have a debate there about whether screening is, is indicated or not. And again, that's, that's controversial. I favour risk-based testing. Um, other colleagues of mine prefer to do more testing than that. HIV zero, essentially, if you look for it, you won't find it because this is a pre-screen population. Um, and again, there are advocates who say that we should retest perhaps for HIV. Uh, I don't agree with that view, but um, that said, it's very important to be aware that the HIV test might have been done several months prior to them flying. And if there's any hint of a risk factor or if they're from a very high prevalence area, then it wouldn't be unreasonable to retest for HIV. But I don't advocate for routine retesting. Similarly, with the history of sexual assault, supposedly, you would think that things like chlamydia and gonorrhea would be common, but 
again, if one looks for it, you don't actually find it, particularly gonorrhea is, yeah, is extremely low prevalence, almost never found. Chlamydia, very low rates, are just occasionally found. Um, and again, it depends on the cohort you're looking at, whether you might find that or not. Um, Strongyloides is an interesting infec uh, infection because it's a parasite that can stay in the gut for and, and in the body for decades and can cause significant problems if people get um, immune compromised in their later age or due to cancer treatment or other intervention or other condition. And so it's important to find that and treat it where it exists. And lastly, uh, in terms of um, this subheading of disease prevention, a mention of some emerging health issues. Disability is emerging because the government policy changed around three years ago, whereby in the past, those with a disability or a health condition which was going to cost the Australian taxpayer a lot of money would have been excluded from getting a visa to come to Australia. Fortunately, and it's a positive policy change in my view, the bar was lowered for those of refugee backgrounds, such as those with a formal refugee visa, are now allowed to get a visa um, despite having something like a disability. So, and the implication for that, however, is that we are now seeing significant numbers of um, refugees with significant health conditions, and which I think, again, from the humanitarian aspect is positive. From the service delivery aspect, it's certainly creating some challenges. We are already seeing, as you know, uh, an increase in hepatocellular carcinoma from chronic hepatitis B and chronic hepatitis C. Uh, in particular, it's interesting to see um, the impact of hepatitis B amongst, say, Vietnamese refugees who arrived here uh, 20 or 30 years ago, um, who at that time were told that they didn't need any treatment or monitoring. Uh, of course, we now know better. Um, and asylum seeker mental health, I put that because there are currently up to 25,000 people who were released from Christmas Island in recent uh, years who will soon be going through their determination process and a high proportion of those may be rejected, i.e. may not get refugee status. The impact on their mental health could be significant and that may have implications for service provision. The next topic is health promotion and <clears throat> just three slides on this and really you can shape this into your own uh, frameworks for health promotion but I'll, I'll just mention some of the issues and so that you're aware and thinking about it and what I think you'll notice is that there's crossover with um, other disadvantaged groups so often in fact you can see that there are commonalities is with say indigenous people or with homeless youth or other uh, significantly disadvantaged groups like that. If we think about refugee settlers and the sort of social determinants of health that might be impacting on them um, and that may need addressing after they arrive here, uh, initially clearly they're not going to be employed, they'll have low English language skills, uh, they're going to have poor socioeconomic status and, and, and so that's very Portion. Often they'll be living in the western suburbs of Sydney if they come to Sydney or, or other parts of the country in uh, less advantaged areas, often in overcrowded homes. They sometimes have trouble getting rental properties because the real estate agents don't want to rent out to them and therefore they have to move and so, so their, their housing can be unstable yeah, and that can impact clearly on, on their, their health and well-being. Education in the past has certainly been disrupted um, and um, training of young people and adults has been disrupted and, and so again they are, um, they are behind in terms of uh, what they may have otherwise been able to achieve. They do tend to catch up very rapidly however. Those with professional qualifications, uh, they are not recognised here and so their, their status is immediately lower than uh, before they left their home country and that could have an impact uh, on their their psychological well-being. Whilst some come into significant communities, nevertheless they may be or feel socially isolated, certainly from the rest of the population um, in, in wherever they're living. Uh, and there are individuals and families who indeed are, are completely isolated and don't want to, for various reasons, associate with individuals from their own communities. There might be political ruptures or other reasons why that is the case. <coughs> 
Acculturation is the process whereby um, newly arrived migrants and refugees take on the um, habits, I guess, and um, characteristics of the culture into which they have come. Uh, that can have some positives, but can also have some negatives. And if you think about, of course, um, the changing of dietary habits, then a move towards less healthy dietary habits when people come to Western countries can certainly impact on, on their, um, their health. Uh, down the track. There can also be, particularly for refugees who have been persecuted by authority figures, by government departments, government agencies, uh, there can be a lack of trust of anyone in authority and that can include the health professions uh, and that may interfere with their interaction uh, with health agencies um, and with their engagement in things such as um, health education programs, for example. This slide is a summary slide um, from a, an article, a really good editorial written now um, over 10 years ago, but I, I still use it because I think it was so succinct and, and revealing because what it um, talks about is how refugees become successful after resettling here. What, it, what does it take to help them to be in a good um, psychological space uh, and to be more productive to, uh, to be more resilient and to settle into their new communities and the sorts of uh, interventions or states that were highlighted um, by Sorbig Ekblad and Derek Silov, whom some of you may know, were effective and humane resettlement services. And in fact, in Australia and New Zealand, we have those things. It's just that the governments don't trumpet them very well, but we have very good resettlement services here. And Unfortunately, the focus is on, on other aspects of um, refugee and asylum seeker policy. Um, conversely, timely clarification of refugee claims. For those who are asylum seekers here, that is not always the case. And, and, and that, that can certainly be important in terms of people's psychological well-being. Encouraging family reunion, likewise, extremely important. Um, we need political leadership to ensure that there is not xenophobia uh, and racism because you can imagine what it must feel like to feel unwanted um, or to be the subject of uh, racial vilification um, or taunts in the country in which you are trying to uh, build a life. Um, work and education opportunities clearly are important. We've alluded to that already. Um, and last on the list actually is, yes, health services because um, they do um, have an impact and can there's certainly a need for those, at least in some cases. Um, and those need to be targeted, as I said, into specialised needs of those who are torture trauma survivors. Um, and finally, some other health promotion approaches, um, uh, recognising that health literacy may be low, um, people's understanding of what's making them sick may not be there, and their knowledge of health services may be limited, so therefore, because the systems here are so different to where they've come from, um, an education component is needed to orientate people to the health system here um, in, the, in Australia or New Zealand. And the sorts of barriers that exist to health service access for all marginalised groups will of course exist for, for those uh, new migrants and refugees, and it's often around cost, around whether the service is appropriate or not, um, and whether it's accessible in terms of uh, transport, uh, time of opening, etc. We always think about settings in the health promotion context and uh, there are some very good um, settings in um, where young, young refugee people in particular can be um, sought out and uh, there are specific high schools, at least in New South Wales, where they go to learn English in an intensive manner for their first few terms and so that's certainly a useful setting um, for health education, health promotion. Then there are other things such as cultural events, religious gatherings, etc. That, that may be useful. Um, partners in the sense of um, organisations are very important um, and be they community groups or professional organisations, very important to work with different partners um, as always in health promotion. And then in terms of health education specifically to those of refugee background, important to note that mainstream programs will most likely miss this population. They're just not going to be exposed to them or if they are exposed, they just may not understand it. So we need tailored programs that look at the gaps in knowledge, look at the gaps in understanding, 
look at the specific risks um, that these populations may be faced with and uh, address, try to address those. And certain specific examples, including uh, using a bilingual community educator model, so that's trained peers, um, which is used with other communities, of course. Audiovisual resources more than written, because literacy can be very low, at least written and reading literacy. So using language specific audiovisual, using ethnic radio, for example, as sorts of uh, DVDs. And finally, um, ensuring that when written resources are developed, it's not just a simple translation of an English version. You need very plain English um, of a low reading age, easily understood, ideally developed from the ground up by the community. So you work with them to, uh, to develop your resource from scratch. So that was health promotion. Um, a couple of slides now, just two slides about cultural competency, um, which will be um, short and sweet, but again, it's just to highlight a couple of issues um, such that you're thinking about this. Um, so clearly in the health setting, be it preventive health or curative health services, effective communication um, is key and engagement with individuals and with their communities is key. Um, and again, you'll, you'll start to recognise some crossovers here with Indigenous health and, and, and other, um, other studies you may have undertaken. Um, we all need to recognise our own cultural background and our own, our own framework and where we're coming from and before we can start to appreciate others. And so that's always number one. I put the word respect there because I think none of us can be experts in all cultures. It's just impossible. Um, uh, but if you start from the standpoint of respecting those from other cultures, it's a really effective and useful mindset to take into, be it an individual consultation or, um, you know, designing a health education program with a community. So and that's why I've listed that there. There are very useful tools and resources available and we should use them. Um, Australia has a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week telephone interpreting service funded by the Department of Immigration, which is national. You can look that up on the website, and that's a very useful tool, and it's free for doctors and specialists in private practice, and, and that's a very useful tool. And the other resource we have are people like cultural advisors who can help us to negotiate with uh, communities. I've already alluded to the importance of partnerships, um, as always, and the sort of key agencies that are relevant for refugees are groups like ethno-specific organisations, so it might be the you know, Syrian women's group, something like that, um, uh, migrant resource centres, which help refugees and migrants in that longer-term settlement over months and years after they arrive, um, are very important partners. They are federally funded. Um, and then again, there may be religious leaders uh, uh, like the measles outbreak amongst um, those of um, uh, Pacific Islander background in, uh, in southwestern Sydney in, in recent times. Uh, they were certainly important uh, in terms of addressing those needs in the community and various professional associations. So with the incoming Syrian influx, we'll be talking to the Australian Arabic Medical Association, for example, um, to give us some insights and to help plan. And then secondly on um, cultural issues is the health system and the notion of cultural bias and this can exist at the high level system level, at the service provision level and then at the individual health provider level. And the concern of course is that it can create or perpetuate health inequities um, that already exist. So what you see is that it, it may be completely unintentional um, and indeed covert, or there can be overt racism in the health system, frankly, um, and quite intentional. So, so a whole range of, um, of cultural bias can exist. And it's interesting, however, to think of the question, well, in terms of our communities now, what is mainstream in so much of um, Australia and New Zealand, the communities are extremely diverse. So one has to ask, who are we directing our services towards? And 
the mainstream, in fact, needs to be that huge proportion of the population who, who don't speak English at home. And that needs to be part of our normal addressing of, uh, of health needs. One of the aspects is that patients and consumers and communities can be excluded from having any influence on the health system. They can be excluded from research because they don't speak um, English, they, they can't give informed consent, uh, and that can have impacts on, on that ongoing um, service provision quality. There are strategies that can assist and a lot of uh, areas might have a multicultural health plan. Um, uh, as I said, I mentioned at the start of the talk that various um, states and territories have refugee health plans of some degree. Um, so they can certainly help. It's important that we always consult with communities um, as we do with other uh, subsets of the population. And we try to include them in representation if there are, for example, consumer groups uh, advising the health system and helping us to plan. And again, that liaison with key agencies and organisations comes up. And finally, education of health professionals as individuals, which might be around the knowledge of exotic diseases like malaria or schistosomiasis, or it might be more broadly around their skills. So training um, GPs on how to use a telephone interpreter. It is a skill. Um, I always tell the medical students, it's like taking blood. You have to learn it and you have to practice it. Um, but it's vital because you can't do your job without it properly. So the last part of um, this webinar on refugee health is uh, addressing a policy that impacts on health. And for this, I thought I would talk about um, a small case study, if you like, and that is the interesting topic of immigration detention. And so that you don't have to read all the massive reports about how unhealthy immigration detention is, I'll summarize it for you. So here are the facts. Prolonged detention is bad for your health. So one study that looked at this was um, uh, Green and Egar in 2010, where they looked at around 10% of the medical records in existence at that time. So at the time, there was around 7,000 people in detention. They looked at 700 medical records. And their conclusions were that there was a clear association between time in detention and rates of mental illness. In particular, those in detention for more than two years had poor health, both mental and physical. Then, more recently than that, we had the uh, Gillian Triggs National Inquiry into Children in Immigration Detention um, that was released last year. Most of you will be aware, attracted a lot of media attention, attracted quite a bit of criticism from the government of the time. And the findings are listed there, essentially uh, focusing on children, but the same thing that detention um, not only caused, but compounded mental health disorders in children. It gave some statistics about estimated prevalence of uh, mental health problems of significance in children. Around a third of them had that, much higher than in the general community. But there are certainly examples of self-harm, including voluntary starvation, that the children were exposed either directly or witnessing uh, assaults, um, including sexual assault and other violence, limited opportunities for normal child activities like play and being educated, um, and cramped environmental living conditions. And the third source I'll mention is the College of Physicians itself. Um, I'll come to that in a moment. A couple of other aspects, and that is it's difficult to provide high quality health care um, somewhere like Manus Island and Nauru. Um, and only this week, uh, again, we've had in the news the fact that um, there were concerns about provision of health care to the individual who, um, who died after getting septicemia um, and who was brought to, to Australia, but, but it was too late. So that's one aspect. Uh, and the other aspect is about health workers who are employed to work in those centres and the notion of dual loyalty. So they are employed by the agency that is contracted to provide health care in the immigration detention. Um, so they have a commitment and a responsibility to that employer, but at the same time their patients are detainees. Um, so as in other custodial settings, um, the concept of dual loyalty is, is very important and very difficult 
So I, I mentioned the College of Physicians has been active in this space and in May of this year they released a position statement and a policy uh, on refugee and asylum seeker health. It was an evidence-based document. It's online. You can find it on the college website, um, over 200 references. Uh, there was consultation on the draft documents, both within the college and externally, um, and their recommendations related to those four areas listed there, health assessments, access to care, promoting long-term health, and then one specifically about detention of asylum seekers. And this is a summary of the, the findings. Um, again, uh, as with those previous references I, I mentioned, Australian held detention, and that's the that's the jargon for locked detention, if you like. Uh, the, the group concluded that this was harmful to the physical and mental health of people of all ages. Um, it alluded to a significant breach of human rights, that the offshore detention centres are worse than the ones on the Australian mainland, so that's Manus and Nauru in particular, and that it presented very strong words, extreme and unacceptable risk to the health of children in particular, including their development and their mental health. And it highlighted the fact that there are some children who are unaccompanied uh, minors in that setting. And, and the last element was related to being able to speak out and the fact that doctors and other health professionals should be able to highlight risks publicly where they felt the need to, and that's been in the media again only today, whereby a special rapporteur um, from the UN has cancelled his visit to Australia for fear that individuals that he might interview would be uh, fall foul of the Border Force Act um, with the threat of jail for two years. Whether that's a reality or not is another matter, but the fact that that concern exists at all is, is an interesting one if you think about transparency. And just a quick slide um, highlighting from the National Commission of Audit, and if one was to think only of the dollar costs of detention um, and to think about different models, this graph compares the different models um, and a relative cost per person for detaining an individuals. Um, so onshore detention is relatively expensive, offshore detention is twice as expensive as onshore, the option of community detention is far cheaper, um, and having people living in the community on bridging visas is the cheapest option of all, and probably the best for their psychological well-being. And these were some photos, um, or drawings I should say, photos of drawings uh, collected at Christmas Island when the um, um, Human Rights Commission group visited uh, Christmas Island um, and spoke with some of the children there. And finally, to say that the medical profession has been very active um, in advocating around these issues. Um, it's not a political issue. It's been both sides of um, governments, um, Labor and Coalition, have progressed the same policies. So um, it's, not, it's not party political. And, and certainly these have been, I think, effective in helping keep these issues um, on the agenda, uh, College of Physicians, um, frequent media statements, um, and also the College of GPs has been involved in that. Um, and in March of this year, this coalition of um, different health professional groups um, banded together, which is quite a feat in of itself, um, to call for the release of children from immigration detention. Thank you very much. Um, that's my email address. Please email me with questions if you wish, um, particularly if uh, you're either not online now or don't have the opportunity to ask a question of me now. Um, you can unblock your own microphones if you wish to speak. If you don't have a microphone, um, feel free to use the chat function. So if you have your mouse over the screen, there's a little gray bar that appears at the bottom and you'll be able to see on the left, um, it says show participants or group chat and use either of those to send me a message if I can press on. Um, we'll just give a minute if anyone has any questions. 
any oh there we go um, so we've got one question from Genevieve Cowboy. She says, how difficult is it for someone in your position to advocate for refugees politically? Right, so the question if people didn't hear was, how difficult is it for someone in my position to advocate for refugees politically? Um, politically, it's very difficult um, because I'm a state government employee. So um, my advocacy has to be of a different nature um, and really it's about sometimes supporting others with the right information. Um, it's about sometimes advocating behind the scenes. Um, so, so, so there is there are different ways to do it. I was on the working group for example that um, drafted the RSCP position statement and policy um, which was a very interesting experience. Uh, we've got a, a number of dedicated um, individuals around the country who, who contributed to that. And uh, so that's that's a way of, of advocating is through through a formal organization that's so it's not you as an individual, um, but it's you know it's part of part of a professional organization. So so uh, it's great that the college has been uh, has been proactive in that way. So look it's a good question. It, it, it is hard and it, it's sometimes frustrating, uh, I guess. And, and sometimes there's things you'd like to say, and occasionally you you just have to take the risk and you know write that letter to the editor because you know you're as mad as hell and you just can't take it anymore. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Any other questions? All right, I don't see that there's any other questions. So um, you can use the email as you can see it on the slide here and uh, Dr. Smith will be happy to answer to you. Other than that, thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, that's very All right, important. thanks everyone for your attention.